thanks so much, Rob. I'm really delighted to be here um, and to talk with you all about a project that I'm extremely excited about. <clears throat> so this weekend, we've already started to see, but we're going to see some really incredible examples of Southern pottery. And here's scholarship that uses um, wonderful documentary research and stylistic analyses to understand how to tie pots back to potters and back to communities. And the work that I do is in that same vein. I'm working to rediscover those links between potters and pots. Um, but I'm looking at ceramics that often lack the visual markers that, um, that we think we need to, to understand those. Um, and I'm looking mostly at the, the undecorated utilitarian wares of the 18th century, and now I'm, now I'm branching sort of backwards and forwards from there. Um, but I'm fascinated by these coarse earthenwares because they're one of the, the only ceramic products that was being made on both sides of the Atlantic in the 18th century. And so we're getting imports from Europe, primarily from, um, from Great Britain, and then we're also having them made here. And so it's really by understanding, by being able to say this pot came from a particular place, we can really start to um, see where American self-sufficiency is coming up against British economic policies that are trying to limit uh, colonists from producing domestically. So these <coughs> um, generic vessels, as I said, they formed the vast majority of potter's repertoires. And, um, and they're, they're the majority of the coarse earthenwares that we find archaeologically. And so it's very frustrating that they're the most difficult to identify. Um, and this is in part because they're being made in the same form um, in standardized shapes and sizes by potters on both sides of the Atlantic and really for hundreds of years because when you find a shape that works, why change it? Uh, and in fact, there was a, um, an act of parliament in England in 1662 that standardized um, the production of butter pots like this. It said that a pot, because the butter was being sold in the pots and so Consumers wanted to make sure they were getting their butter's worth, right? So um, you would have, so the pot could, should weigh at least 20 pounds, uh, or the pot of, with butter in it would weigh 20 pounds, and no more than six pounds of that could be the pot empty in weight. So we see that there's some, um, some good reasons why we're seeing things being made in the same shapes and sizes over time. <clears throat> And then furthermore, we're seeing things being made in very similar ways because it's the same people making them and they're intentionally copying from the British traditions. So this is an advertisement from St. Mary's County, Maryland, 1756. The potter Thomas Baker, who says, I'm producing earthenware of the same kind as imported from Liverpool in, in England or made in Philadelphia. And not only that, he has provided with good workmen from Liverpool in Philadelphia. So he's able to say, I can, I can make pots that look just like these ones from places that you know because I have the people um, who have worked in those places. So he's not just copying, he's actually reproducing. Now I come to this work as an archaeologist, and uh, so we rely on ceramics for so many things, for understanding a site's occupation history, for understanding the people who lived there, their, um, their economic status, the, their engagement with the colonial market, um, and, and their taste, what, what sort of things they, they appreciated. And in our line of work, we rarely uncover a piece of ceramic that's bigger than the palm of your hand. And so this is, uh, and so this is, can be a challenge, but for many of the wares that we find, like these cream wares, like Chinese porcelains, like these decorated refined earthenwares, because of um, <clears throat> because the shapes are much more easily identifiable, the decorative techniques have much uh, better, we have a bet better understanding of the production of when they were popular. Um, so even if it's a small piece of one of these kind of ceramics, we can generally say a lot about it. But that's not the case with redwares. So this, in contrast, are fragments of lead glazed coarse earthenware. And um, you could call these black glazed redwares. So you can see that there's some variation in paste color, and there's some variation in the glaze color. Some is more brown than black. Uh, but 
It may surprise you to learn that these are actually from, these 18 sherds are from 10 different kiln sites on both sides of the Atlantic and made between around 1600 and 1900. So tremendous variation. So when we find one of these archeologically, kind of take a look at it and say, well, that's redware and you know, what, are you, what, what else can you do with that? Um, and so they've been treated by, by many historical archeologists as kind of a analytical dead end. We can sort of say in a generic sense what it is, but we can't um, really go much further from that. And this is very unsatisfying um, and I wasn't happy about it. And so, because I know how much valuable information is within those pots about how, um, how they were made and who made them and, and who bought them. So I set out to figure out how to source these very generic wares. I wanted to know where they were coming from and what sort of patterns there were in their use over time. My initial focus was in the Chesapeake region of Maryland and Virginia, so that's primarily what I'm talking about today. And given, as I've said, that our typical methods are not good for reliably telling these wares apart, I focus on compositional attributes rather than form or decoration. And I'll explain what I mean by that. <clears throat> so to talk about composition, we have to think about geology, and Mark sort of got us into, into thinking about that. Ceramics are made out of clay, of course, and clays weather out of rock, and the rock retains what you can think of as a chemical fingerprint that has to do with the formation processes that created it. And so <clears throat> that rock, the, that chemical fingerprint is carried through into the clay and into the fired pot. So we can, so we can think really geologically about a pot and tie it back to a geographic location. So this is a geological map of um, mostly Virginia and Maryland with some um, of the upper, P of upper North Carolina. And sort of circled here are some of the regions where there are known historical earthenware kiln sites that have been investigated archeologically. And here they are indicated here. These are all ones that I looked at for, my, for this project. You can see there a number in North Carolina along in the Shenandoah Valley, um, and then up the furthest north I looked at was in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. <clears throat> so my assumption was that many of the wares that, I that were being found domestically in Virginia and Maryland probably came from somewhere around Virginia and Maryland, so that was sort of why I focused on this region. But then I also had to account for those imports that are coming in from, from Great Britain, and so I also went over to Great Britain and looked at um, three main regions that I knew were exporting wares in quantity to, um, to the American colonies. So this is also a, a geological map of Great Britain. So I looked at the coal measures, which includes places like Staffordshire, also Buckley and Liverpool, um, down here around London um, and Essex, and then here the Surrey-Hampshire border uh, down along the Black River. So I looked at um, 24 kiln sites in North America and 13 in Great Britain. And I, from each of those, I collected wasters. So these are the pots that, for whatever reason, never made it off of the kiln site. They broke at some point during the firing process or unloading or, or what have you, one of the many vagaries of, of pottery production. And so um, <coughs> I didn't just look at black glazed redwares, but I, I put these up here to trick you. So um, the, the labels show you where these were produced. So there's a bit of an Atlantic Ocean in between. So all these ones on the left are American. All the ones on the right are from Great Britain. And so in all, I had 400 kiln wasters from these uh, 37 sites. And I wasn't trying to use these to link back to the individual pottery. I was more interested in looking at region. So to say, if I, could def if I could look at a shirt and say, this came from the Shenandoah Valley, rather than saying, this came from Emanuel Souter. <clears throat> and so, ba and basing that on the expected geological differences in the, um, within each sort of region. And so I had these reference samples, which were my knowns, and then I selected 184 samples from domestic sites that were my unknowns. So these came from plantations 
across the Chesapeake, and I'll speak more about those in a moment. So how did I turn these into data that I could use to source? So I focused on characteristics that don't require decoration on the shirt or vessel form information. Most of what we find are just body shirts. So there's just not a whole lot of um, visual information that we're used to thinking about. So thinking about compositional attributes, and we can break these down into two categories. There's the visible, things you can see with the naked eye, and then there's invisible, so things that you can't see with the naked eye. So one of the first visible ones would be inclusions and voids. So these are um, bits of rock, such as quartz or um, metal oxides, and such as um, hematite, that are naturally occurring in many earthenware clays. Um, it could also be things that were added intentionally to the clay to, um, to increase its stability. Um, and voids would be things that maybe burnt out during the firing, so natural inclusions that, uh, that burnt during the firing. So I was measuring these, um, what the presence of them, how many, uh, or sort of the density of them. And then also looking at oxidation and reduction of the, the clay the paste density and texture, and the paste color. And these three things really have a lot to do with kiln technology. So in thinking about um, compositional attributes, I'm kind of toggling between the raw materials, so the clays um, that were used to produce these pots, and the technological decisions of the potters. So um, in thinking about these things, it has to do with um, how hot the kilns were getting, how much oxygen was getting in, uh, so, for example, in many of the English kilns, they're um, coal firing, they get um, quite hot, there's good reduction, so you end up with wares that in some cases almost feel like stonewares, they've um, gone more glassy, almost, um, and they tend to be a nice deep red or into brown, whereas the earliest American products being made um, in the late 17th century, the kilns were not able to um, maintain temperature quite as well. So you see they tend to be paler, softer, um, and they don't have, um, don't have that, um, that strength of some of the, the high-fired wares that you get later on. And so the really exciting things is if you're paying attention to these, you can really track uh, chronologically and geographically as kiln technology is improving across, uh, the, across America. And then also thinking about surfaces. So glazes, um, slips, and washes, where they glaze just on the interior and both the interior and exterior, and things like that. So those are the main uh, visible compositional attributes. But then there's also the invisible ones. So there's mineral composition, so these building blocks of clay, um, looking at both the paste and the inclusions. So um, I didn't focus too much on minerals because once you hit about 700 degrees Celsius, the, um, the clay minerals start to transition into new minerals. So it's difficult to identify them because they've, many of them have changed or are sort of in the process of changing. And so instead, I focused on elemental composition. So as, as Rob said, I, we are getting into the atomic level here. So remember your periodic table. So this is what we're talking about, looking at the very fundamental um, composition of the clays that are being used to make these pots. <clears throat> and so the technology that I chose here was, it's a, it's a mouthful, laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. Um, I'll just call it LAICPMS. Um, so this is a relatively recent technique and one that's, um, and even more recently applied to archaeological materials. But it's really fabulous because um, it's minimally destructive, so essentially I break off a tiny piece of a sherd and mount it on a microscope slide along with many others, and then a laser runs across that um, in a very small line. It's about, it's just over half a millimeter, so we're talking just over a twentieth of a centimeter, so teeny, teeny, tiny um, is collecting just a little bit of that material and taking it into the machine. I'd be happy to spout off at length about that uh, for anyone who's interested, but for the rest of you, I won't bore you with it. But so I'm able to 
uh, look at a really wide range of elements, and I chose 37 that, um, that have been shown to be useful for, for clay composition. <clears throat> and so um, I began by analyzing the production site data, those 400 wasters from kiln sites, in order to see how the groups differed elementally. And then I could use that model that I created to source my unknowns where I had no clue where they were coming from. So this work is very computational, and I use a variety of statistical techniques to understand these relationships that you can't see with the naked eye. Um, but so we come up with a lot of ways to visualize it to make it, to make it easier to understand. And this is a, a discriminant analysis by plot. So if you don't speak statistics, totally fine. But just remember that things that are closer together are more related than things that are further apart. So we're looking for things to group together. Each of these dots is representing one of those 400 samples. And let me see if I can get it to spin again. Um, um, so we see that um, the gray samples are from North Carolina. They are exceptional, as we would all expect. Uh, so they're very different elementally from everything else. We have London down here. So all the shirts from the London area are very different. And then the colors that are kind of pastel are all from um, England and Wales. And the ones over here are all from the Mid-Atlantic. So you can see that there's still some, some blobbiness just looking in three dimensions. But what we're doing is condensing variation from 36 dimensions. It's very difficult to conceptualize 36 dimensions. If you all have a good way to do it, I'd love to hear it. But this is, this is sort of the best that we've come up with. But when you look at sort of further dimensions, each of those groups sort of separates pretty cleanly. So I could say, um, so I could distinguish where's from Alexandria from where's from the rest of the coastal plain of Virginia and Maryland. So I used some other statistics to make sure that those groups that we can see are actually real groups and not sort of made up. Um, and then I could use these groups to match my unknowns. And the unknown shirts are coming from, oops, are coming from nine plantations in Maryland and Virginia. There are uh, four in Maryland, five in Virginia. And I chose plantation sites because <clears throat> historians had said had suggested at, at some points that, um, that slaves were being given sort of the potter's seconds, or the really the crappiest of local pots, and that the planters were continuing to use imported wares. And I really wanted to know if that was true, um, to see if there was this social stratification of pottery production, because I had, um, it, didn't, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And so um, I looked, in order to understand that, I looked at assemblages from, from households, both of enslaved people and planters and free white workmen on these plantations. So you can see that there are multiple, um, multiple assemblages from most of these plantations. And so when I plotted these into my model, um, very luckily, I, um, most of the samples that I had, actually, I was able to source, and I'll show you that in a moment. But then um, most of the sherds from Monticello and Poplar Forest, and these are two plantations in the Piedmont of Virginia, both owned by Thomas Jefferson. The sherds from those plantations were very different. So this is a two-dimensional representation of that spinny thing we just saw, and the circles represent the, the groups that I, was, um, that I had defined. And so <clears throat> Each of these little triangles is one of the samples from these plantations. So you can see some of them are overlapping with, um, with groups that I expected to see. So there are a few from over here in the coal measures from Liverpool. Um, there's some from around the London area. And then there's this big group that falls outside of any of my expected groups. And elementally, it's falling in between the North Virginia Piedmont and uh, the North Carolina Piedmont. And so this, to me, suggests that these sherds are actually coming from the central Virginia Piedmont. That's very exciting, because we have no known kiln sites from that region in the 18th century, in 18th century or even into the 19th century. So it seems that, um, that Jefferson had a special source for his pots that, um, that we need to discover. Um, 
So I look forward to more research on that. Um, and if anyone has ever heard of a kiln site in this, in this part of Virginia, I'd love to, to hear about it. And so um, just to look overall at the results, so um, it's probably too small to read here, but these are how the wares that I was sourcing had been originally cataloged. So all of these ones over here, these are um, British ones, so from Buckley, from Staffordshire, from London, um, and then unID'd. So 90% of them were, were unidentified. We just called them redware um, because most, um, most historical archaeologists don't, um, don't have good collections of local earthenwares in order to say that we think that this is local, so there aren't very many identified American wares in historical collections. And so this, then this is the, um, the results of my research. So in addition to the British ware types that I had previously been identified, I also found wares from Liverpool, which was exciting because we knew, of course, that lots of refined earthenwares were coming, were being exported from Liverpool to the colonies in the 18th century. We didn't know that we were still get, that we were also getting coarse earthenwares. And if you remember back to Thomas Baker, the advertisement I showed you earlier, he's advertising that he has potters from Liverpool making these coarse earthenwares. And so we see that, that um, Liverpool was a recognized source that was continuing into the, the late 18th century. So that, is, um, that was very cool. And then all of these ones in blue over here are American sources. So there's Philadelphia, Alexandria, the Tidewater, Virginia, uh, the Northern Virginia Piedmont, um, the Shenandoah Valley, the Southern Ridge and Valley, Sedona and Botetourt County, and then this large bar here is that new group, that um, group that's probably Central Virginia Piedmont. And the unknowns is a much smaller category. There were uh, less than 10 out of 184 that I, that I couldn't say where they came from with some degree of certainty. <clears throat> and so just one more way to summarize this, when we look over time, it's really interesting to see the dominance of local wares and how quickly local production overtakes importation. So I was looking primarily at the 18th century, as I said. So in the first quarter of the 18th century, it's about half and half local to imported. So we have um, Europe in the sort of orange and American in the green. By mid-century, most are local. And in the second half of the 18th century, almost all of the wares that we're seeing are local. And not only were local wares present in early assemblages, but they're present in every assemblage of all social classes. So this is suggesting really that everyone made use of local products. This probably comes as a surprise to none of you. Uh, but it's, it's great to see this pattern laid out so starkly. Uh, that's how successful American potters were at meeting the needs of their communities. Oops. Oops. Now, though I focused on sourcing to broad regions, the results were, were really specific enough. So this elemental resolution is good enough to identify individual potteries. So here I'm looking just at potteries from the Shenandoah Valley and um, the ones from the northern extent of the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, so from um, Anthony Baker and, um, and Andrew Pittman are very separate over here. And then the ones from further south, from Rockingham County, from Brockbridge County, are also distinctive. And so as I continue this project, um, I look forward to having better resolution, not just to region, but actually to, um, to, smaller, um, to smaller groups and smaller areas and perhaps individual potters um, for sourcing. And then furthermore, at sites where they were producing both earthenware and stoneware, I, was, I sampled some earthenwares because I wanted to see how, sim how similar the clays being used were. And um, these are just showing you surfaces and cross sections of earthenwares and stonewares from two of, two of those sites. So the Swan Smith Milburn site in Alexandria, the earthenwares are over here, the stonewares are over here and the John Heatwell site in, in Rockingham. And so the, again, earthenware's over here, stoneware's over here. And the elemental signatures are still close enough to match. And in some cases, as with John Heatwell, it's, it's pretty apparent that they're using the exact same clay 
to produce both earthenware and stoneware. Uh, this, and in the Shenandoah Valley in particular, it seemed that, um, that those clays were good enough as is to produce both wares. The elemental technique that I use is equally um, appropriate for stonewares as earthenwares. I haven't focused as much on stonewares because we know stoneware clay was traveling much further distances than earthenware clays, so that it was being um, bought and taken across state lines, and that gets really complicated to figure out elementally where the geological source is. But, um, but as I get more samples, uh, that, will, that will resolve. So it's something I'm looking forward to doing is incorporating more stonewares. And so now that I've identified the products from different sources, and these are those shirts from Monticello, so 75% of those or so are coming from that new mystery zone um, with a few shirts from, from Liverpool and and the Coastal Plain Inn as well. So now that I've um, gotten sort of an elemental bearing on them, I went back and looked at all of the visible characteristics again, because ultimately we can't analyze everything elementally. One day maybe, not in the next 10 years probably, will it be affordable to, and not only that, but some people don't want you to blast their things with lasers, and I understand that. So um, so it's it's important that we have we get better at, um, at pattern recognition for, for these small, um, these characteristics such as um, oxidation and inclusions and um, paste color, things that we typically don't record for coarse earthenwares and redwares, but um, my research shows are actually really useful markers of source. So I'm working on that now. Um, I'm building my database of reference materials to encompass more historic kiln sites. Uh, and to add stonewares and colonowares as well. And I've recently branched out uh, into the Caribbean, looking at Jamaica and uh, Dominica and Barbados. I'm particularly interested to see if any mainland American redwares show up in Barbados, given the interesting colonial history between those two colonies. And um, my preliminary results suggest that maybe they are. And so that's something that I look forward to um, doing a lot more with. But in general, these results are, are really exciting to me because they're making the invisible visible. They're helping to reestablish those links between potters and pots. And the utilitarian production in the colonies was downplayed or omitted from many historical records, as you can see here talking about the poor potter in Yorktown. And, that's, and, and I know that the pots that I study were not expensive and that they likely never had pride of place in the home, maybe now they do in our homes, but, um, but they were extremely valuable for their owners, for their, for their function, making it possible for colonists to prepare and store food and to conduct a variety of essential household tasks. And so, as I've demonstrated, I, we really have the technology now to resolve fundamental questions about these wares, the ones that, um, that Rob spoke about where was this pot made? When was it made? Who made it? We have, we have that technology. Um, we have that capability now. And by addressing those really basic gaps in our knowledge, we open up a whole new universe of research questions about potters and the social and economic relationships in early America. So um, I think that is what I have to say. Thank you so much. This work would not have been possible without the many generous people who contributed wasters, some of whom are in the audience, um, many institutions and, and support. So thank you very much.